so what do you actually look at when you look when you talk to a candidate what are the key skill set that he should have at an entry level now when we talk about consulting so you are doing risk consulting yes so for the audience what does that mean so uh, when we say risk consulting um, uh, purely this is uh, on, on the non uh, audit side of business so hmm. uh, now within risk consulting if, uh, if somebody is working with around 3 years 4 years of experience what ideal skill set he should have to succeed in that consulting space this consulting cfa qualification helps them to understand you know the nuances of Products. which instrument which product etc right how is working in consulting different than working in industry the, the major fact in consulting is uh, it's very solution driven mm-hmm. uh, and industry i would say that now with respect to the uh, young professionals who want to join the consulting space uh, you must be taking a lot of interviews so what is something one or two things that you can share that people should avoid in interviews and especially in risk consulting Hello guys hi this is Ganesh Naik I help finance professionals and students to excel in their career and as a part of that journey I'm going to be coming out with a lot of podcast series and today also we have with us Ram Ram Kumar he's going to be helping us with understanding what exactly happens in the risk advisory space what are the challenges what are the opportunities for you guys in the finance sector So first of all Ram Kumar thank you very much sir thank you. for joining us and if uh, for the benefit of the audience if you can talk about your journey So how you started in the industry and now being a partner at a particular company what what are you what are we, what was your journey overall perfect uh, so ganesh thank you for the opportunity uh, happy to do that because a lot of youngsters including myself when i started my journey had lack lack of what you call guidance or mentoring so happy to be here to speaking to you about this uh, my journey started um, way back in 2008 uh, but the journey started prior to that uh, i am a indian born Kenyan bred uh, UK educated uh-huh. person yes uh, but indian on her heart and india brought me back way back in 2008 i started my journey with a, a small a, a indian chartered accounting firm was mm-hmm. with them about 8 months it's where i started my journey as an analyst uh, while i was there i was working with a lot of manufacturing organizations in terms of you know doing the internal audit uh, um, okay. doing their sop creations and all the stuff and there was a lot of travel and you meet very different So, specter of people and different right. kinds of, uh, you know, uh, personalities on a day-to-day basis. So that eight months was a huge learning curve for me. I, I mean, I came from UK to India. I did not know much of the place because, though I was born in Bombay, uh, Bom- uh, Bombay was known to not know to me because I was traveling. Okay. Well, my dad had a transferable job. We moved across India. I was in Kenya and then London. And when I came to India, it was a cultural shock. I remember the first day when I went to do my interview. I just could not uh, comprehend the crowd and how they travel in this uh, in this country. So that was the first culture shock. But it, I got used to it. Uh, okay. It it grew on me as okay. we went along. Uh, so that that and when I came in, um, I was an unknown. I thought my degree. I'm a. I'm I'm going to get my job easily. So when I realized how difficult the market is to get mm. you get a job. So I ended up in my uh, this chartered accounting firm. Okay. Uh, started uh, uh, started as a base to learn uh, what in how Bombay operates, how India operates. So okay. it was like a stepping stone. I started with a stipend of six thousand rupees. Okay, it was very less amount, and it, for my qualification, it did not have the right uh, pay. Uh, mm-hmm. But I decided I will do that. Was well, spent about eight months, and that's when. Uh, after I did my eight months, I my CV was with some of the larger consulting firms, okay. and one of the big fours uh, uh, interviewed me, and I joined them. Uh, and in the non-FS side, non non-financial services mm-hmm. side, uh, on the retail sector, uh, that's where I started my career. Uh, because of the manufacturing uh, background I had in the eight months in the in the uh, tier two firm, mm-hmm. I took that experience, and uh, they liked my profile, and they offered me as an analyst there also. Right. and that's where my journey started uh, or rather my second stint started mm-hmm. uh, worked there for about 6 uh, years i in the non fs no, uh, no, uh, within that i'll, I'll, I'll tell you the story in sto- there's a story okay. within the story uh, they i started in the non fs side initially as an analyst uh, moved up to associate consultant mm-hmm. and then to a consultant 
while when i was a consultant um, in the non fs side um, there was an opportunity uh, there is this my, uh, mindset i had because of my background of being uh, holding a masters in fi- international bank and finance i wanted right. to do uh something the banking side i want to work in the financial service sector so i had a word with my senior uh, in terms of wanting to have a transfer within the organization within a different business unit mm. uh he was very uh, uh kind he was career oriented he wanted his people to grow okay. he had a word with a very senior partner within the organization who was working in the financial service sector and uh hand got me an opportunity to get a transfer so this was in 2012 so 2000 um 8 to uh sorry 2008 to 2000 uh, sorry 2009 is the time i started in uh, uh, april and uh, november december i joined e- uh, this organization and for about 3 years i was uh, uh working uh, in the non fs side okay. and 2012 i moved to the fs side mm-hmm. and i was there for about 2 years okay uh, within that team uh, 2015 is the time i was there in this organization and then um uh I decided that after having spent six years in this organization, I thought I need to understand how other consulting firms operate. Okay. And that's when I moved to another larger uh, uh, big four. Mm-hmm. Uh, was working with for for about a year, and then th- this was the time I I started working back with a senior who is yet work I'm working back with, and we okay. work back together a lot. Uh, and with him, I moved uh, two or three organizations, and I. Have, I moved as a from when I, when I left this organization, I joined uh, the other organization as a manager, and then uh, then associate director. Then uh, moved uh, to okay. my current organization as a director. Moved on to executive director, then to a partner. So okay. the journey has been uh, over the last fifteen years. Uh, started as an analyst and to, to a partner, okay. and every step I have I have worked on every level, which is. there in uh, on offer basically okay wonderful so now so roughly around 8 9 years in the fs side if i'm not wrong uh, t- just t- about 10 10, 10, uh, 10 to 12 years probably okay. because 3 years were non fs and about 12 years in fs yeah okay now for the benefit of the audience what does a hierarchy generally looks in a any consulting firm how does somebody what at what level somebody starts okay and like till what level maximum it can go good question Uh, Ganesh, actually, um, uh, the hierarchy is um, quite uh, about seven or eight levels. You can say mm-hmm. you start at a analyst uh, level or uh, intern level. That's the, the that's the entry point okay. for freshers. Then you move on to a uh, to a associate consultant level. Mm. Then you progress. Uh, that analyst level is two to three years is what they look okay. at. Majorly two years. Then you move to consultant. Mm. In consultant, again two to three years. Mm. Then you become a senior consultant another two to three years, okay. and uh, manager another two to three years, and uh, you move uh, to uh, uh, associate director. Sometimes some organizations call it senior manager level, AD or a senior manager. Mm-hmm. Then you progress to a director, and then to a partner. Every stage you're looking at a two to three years. So if you're a high performing or a, or a person who is uh, absolutely good at what you're doing, it happens in a uh, two year time frame. Okay. but if you have a steeper learning curve 3 years um but um, your question also stated oh, where do where do we start we have uh, lateral hi- lateral people joining and mm-hmm. entry level joining mm-hmm. many people at entry level is at the analyst level but we have lateral hires also so people who have completed their chartered accountancy or completed their frm or completed the cfa mm-hmm. who join us after they have uh, uh Attain the qualification, have got certain years of experience, so they come in at a, a uh, at a senior okay. consultant or a or a uh, consultant level, consultant senior consultant, even at a manager level. So they are lateral hires, so people come from outside the organization. Like an example, right, being right, myself, right. who have moved uh, from organizations and laterally joined at a higher level. Got so it. entry points are throughout the seven or eight stages I've spoken about. Hmm. Largely, many people join at the beginning level. You know, so a lot of. Okay. uh so for your viewers who are coming in um there are a lot of campus placements which happen in a lot of colleges mm. so we seek to hire them from those colleges so that they can progress uh through okay. the whole journey but that's so anybody who's joining at the end, uh, analyst level it's a pure fresher it's a fresher yes. absolutely fresher so what do you actually look at when you look when you talk to a candidate 
what are the key skill set that he should have at an entry level okay entry level so one basic requirement is uh, graduate um, mm -hmm. so graduate and doesn't have to be uh, it doesn't have to be a specific of a stream uh, an example i'm trying to tell you is that uh, we have uh, within consulting there's different kinds of uh, industry specification you have a retail sector you have manufacturing oil and gas financial services okay. blah 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 okay. so even uh, students who are uh, doing who have taken science as a stream are also welcome why is okay. because when you are working with an organization which is into oil and gas an example and you've mm -hmm. done mechanical engineering the idea is because the kind of business oil and gas in you the qualifications you have you'll be able to relate yes. to, this, to those uh, uh, industry terminologies, terminologies and all the stuff okay. so answer your question qualification at, across the various sectors is something uh, okay. we, uh, you know we, uh, it's open for there is no restrictions okay. and um, one of the things we look at while looking at analyst level is attitude you know someone who has a great attitude towards wanting to learn a lot of new things mm. so we look for folks you know who are uh, hungry for learning new stuff because mm. consulting is very very open ended it's learning right. on the job uh, while there will be someone to mentor you and coach you in how to do things Uh, there would be uh, certain uh, uh, places where you will have to pick Manage, up the mantle yes. on your own so we look for such individuals who are uh, going to be able to take up the uh, pressures of right um, of the the demands of the job able to come up with a solution oriented approach so we look for such individuals uh, so there is no because generally when i speak to people so they have a thought process that okay if i if graduates fresh graduates that i need to be good in calculation or i need to be very good in uh, understanding the details then only i'll get hired is this true no at the entry level it is not it's okay. not it's about having the right attitude so we're looking okay. for uh, individuals who so obviously we look at academics but academics is not the only criteria mm. we look at uh, soft skills how they are spoken how they are conducting themselves okay. um their uh, their aptitude towards uh, other things beyond education is something we look at because uh, we we we'll, we look for a well grounded individual individual who has uh, done multiple facets within with at their academic uh, uh, world mm. uh, which will help them in the uh, consulting world like when i say by that someone has to be able multitasking is something we look for person right. because at one time you'll be doing xyz project other time you'll be doing abc project right. you need to have the ability to to switch on and switch off at any any given point in time so basically in the cv apart from the education side what extra you do yeah okay wonderful and like you said that uh, so any background can come so you do uh, generally consulting firms do hire engineers also yes we do okay so it's open okay. it's open now like you like you talked about the the hierarchy so analyst then consultant senior consultant manager so i'm assuming correct me if i'm wrong at a manager level you are responsible for the execution of the project yes absolutely okay but not man talking managing the client to an extent yes uh, okay. but not at a c suit or a cxo level at a mid management level they will be expected with whom you are interacting on yes. a day to day basis with the data yes. and all of that yes. okay and then gradually when you enter into associate director level and partner level that's where you so also we, have to have some connect in terms of talking to the cxo yes. yes yeah basically okay so kind of uh, combination of soft skill more uh, stakeholder management responsibility and execution of the project also. correct but you will not be day to day involved correct into the project perfect now when we talk about consulting so you are doing risk consulting yes so for the audience what does that mean okay so uh, when we say risk consulting um, uh, purely this is uh, on, on the non audit side of business so hmm. uh, so the organization i work for is a large uh, chartered accounting firm mm -hmm. uh, but we do have clientels who are who we don't directly uh, work on the audit side so we work on the advisory side so i'm on from the advisory side so risk consult is all about advisory mm -hmm. uh, so we act as solution providers to some of the problem statements uh, some of these companies have an example on the risk side would be is that you know i have all these processes which are so scattered i do not know how to fix it okay so they'll come to me uh, as an organization i help i help uh, uh, they will they'll speak to me and i will come up with a solution a solution approach to fix the problem 
Okay. So it will be a like step by step process. This is this is what I'll first do. So if your processes are, are fragmented, how to br bring the processes together? So that would entail, for example, if there are standard operating procedures which have been um, drafted, okay. we'll try and see if any of those standard operating procedures require any tightening in terms of anything being missed. Okay. So if standard operating procedures are not even there, how do I draft and create. create one? After that, you know, obviously when you have a standard operating procedure, you have risk and controls which emanate from it. Right. So we define the risk and controls emanating from the SOP. Then what we tend to do is, how are those risk and controls, uh, what you call operating? Okay. We then tend to do a testing. Once we test it, we tend to report it saying that control testing. Control testing. <laughs> so when you say control testing, you to say how, if the risks which are there, to what extent are the controls uh, okay. if, uh, built in the system which can mitigate the risk coming out of that process. Got it. So we tend to fix that. Now what happens is when they are fixing it, they'll say, okay, this control is failing uh, for this risk. Mm. Can you fix put the controls in place? So it could be a automated or a manual control so okay. automated control is we bring in technology so that's when a technology consulting team will come and say how we fix a problem for you so okay. ganesh i'm trying to in a very simplistic way explain to you what is that i do so we we look at a process we look at the deficiencies and we fix those deficiencies it okay. could be that a, uh, it could be a major or a minor fix but that's what we do but in is it only related to the operations like for example, operational risk side. Correct. It's only to that. If so if somebody is facing a challenge with respect to managing their market risk. We do. We do. But that, that will also come under the risk consulting. Risk consulting. So okay. um, what I handle is uh, on the op side, but operations, when you talk about market risk, credit risk, everything comes under risk consulting. Okay. But so you have a vertical within that. We, we have different uh, specialist SME groups within the team who, okay. who will cater for that. So at a broader consulting company level, it is either audit or advisory yes within advisory you might have cyber advisory you might have risk Correct. Con consulting okay okay so broadly that is a bifurcation but one ex one question that you said one point that you said that you will go and check whether the control is working or not so you will do that audit check also yes so uh, so uh, this is how it starts with uh, so if for example let's take let's take out a startup a startup comes and uh, mm -hmm. you know they have processes built in place but this process are very fragmented because because um, XYZ is doing it on radio. He it is there in his head that he does this. Right. It is not documented right. anywhere, and uh, he doesn't have a time to document those processes. Mm -hmm. That's why they come in. Look, I do this X Y these things, but I I don't have the time to 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 document right. it. Can you will you able to help me? So our team will co go to that person, sit with him on a day to do a walkthrough. We call it a walkthrough. Mm. Walkthrough in sense we sit in his shoes, in his uh, right. in his uh, day to day job understand what he is doing and document it. That becomes a standard operating procedure. Once we put that in place, now we have done this uh, SOP. Yes, it is SOP based on someone's understanding of, or what's, how the business needs to operate. Right. But do we really know that the stand or process is actually working well? Hmm. We do not know. So we have to then test it. So how do you test it? We can't do it with just looking at SOP. We need to have right. a risk and control. Right. So we built a risk and control matrix and that risk and control matrix will be used by somebody to identify using transactions which have been conducted in the organization and testing that if the risk uh, for which the controls have been fixed is actually, it actually, actually working work or not. Okay, wonderful. So now within risk consulting, if, uh, if somebody is working with around three years, four years of experience, what ideal skill set he should have to succeed in that consulting space, risk consulting. Okay. Uh, so many a times we have uh, folks who come with undergraduate qualification, which I said, it's across domain mm -hmm. engineers, BCOMs, uh, you know, management uh, graduates and all the stuff. Then they graduate towards uh, getting a qualifications, which are uh, uh, either a CFA. So I'll tell you who does go, does a CFA. These are all folks, you know, who work with uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, corporate treasury side because as, as I, I was right. talking to you before we started this podcast about something on corporate treasury so this is the a mirror of uh, banking treasury 
and what happens is uh, many corporate treasurers have four sets of uh, requirements long term borrowings short term borrowings then you have uh, investments mm-hmm. and you have uh, uh, borrowings uh, long term short term and then there is lending also mm-hmm. so uh, cfa qualification helps them to understand you know the nuances of Production. which instrument which product etc right so that helps them also when the theoretical knowledge they get from the cfa how they can apply it in the real world with some of the organizations small okay. small medium size or startups in terms okay. of what is that solutions they can drive from the qualifications they garner now uh, there are some who look to do financial risk management purely mm-hmm. on the quant side numbers because um, Uh, you you refer to credit risk or market risk okay. so we work with a lot of banks you know who have market risk uh, department who are trying to get understand what what is the risk which is there within their banking uh, parlance and how yeah. someone can fix it so having an frm qualified person helps also okay. to quantify the the risk which emanates from their uh, banking operations so basically what you are saying is you start the journey and then you basically specialize yes within that but somebody who is suppose in your current role your operation risk side and he wants to move to the market side so how flexible it is to move because Flex- you are Flex- doing a one kind of work for 5 6 year and then moving so we don't restrict in uh, people moving it's okay. it is it is a, a it is a career choice like an example i gave for myself i was on a non fs side i took a right. fund to go to fs side that, that's like a changing in industry itself yes, yes. you're talking about someone changing a skill set that is also we welcome but for that to happen we always tend to encourage so as you go up the levels we always encourage people to first Uh, get a second in line built for them to move to the next to the other role ha, ha, so okay. we tend to ask people to uh, find another person within the team who wants to play their role for them to play the role of okay of, fill the gap and then you move basically. yes okay interesting but then also you can also uh, specialize say for example i want to look into climate risk that opportunity would also yes, be there so yes. it's open within the consulting space so i i i think i i for that you know for better understanding of how risk consulting happens so the 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 department which i work in is called uh, esg and risk consulting that's that's a, that's a, that's what the the bu is called business unit is called and esg and risk consulting comprises of six or seven other competencies under it hmm. so we have um, uh, something called the esg which is environment and social mm, governance yes, yes, yes. then we have cyber okay. uh, cyber and it then we have uh, corporate intelligence we got forensic then you have uh, okay. uh, gro which is governance risk and organization okay. and then the fourth one which i sit in the financial services risk advisory okay. so these are the six competencies within this competency there are a lot of solutions which we offer and um, your question you asking in terms of if someone is wanting to work in climate risk yes uh, if there is an opportunity there is always that uh, discussions which can happen between yeah. the two competency leaders the partners within this bus right. to discuss and say that do you have a, a opening or are you looking for a, a person so obviously the fungibility needs to be there in terms of or the opening needs to be there for this transfer to happen or a project where he can work he or she can work on a temporary okay. basis can provide the show, show the mental and then move to it, that move that's correct okay but does that happen that when you go to a client you got a project which is related to operations and then within that you need expertise into cyber that also happens yes so, so you will pitch in somebody from the cyber team yes he will work in the project okay. so so this esg and risk consulting group which i spoke about uh, our mandate is uh, to provide our solutions not as one single competency but as multiple competencies so it will require us to bring the cyber expertise there are lot of our clients who are looking for forensic expertise in the day to day work we are doing because they they okay. don't want fraud related matters to be a afterthought they want it to be Check. pre-empt preempted yes. and be to be built in the current process instead right. okay. so we bring in our forensic experts also to see in terms of in the existing processes how can you put mitigants to avoid a risk of fraud happening so uh, so all this uh, team so as you said uh, climate risk 
so we work with a lot of banks, you know, who are looking for ESG professionals. Mm. So we have the ESG team. So we'll have a specialist from the ESG team who is uh, an expert on the climate risk side to work on a particular project so that we can uh, work together and provide those solutions according to the client. So it's kind of a bouquet of service that you basically take to the client. Yes. Okay. Now for the audience, how is working in consulting different than working in industry? Okay. Uh, the, the major fact in consulting is uh, it's very solution driven mm. uh, and in industry I would say that you have a set of method, the method to the madness. In consulting you don't have a, that. In consulting okay. is uh, there is uh, control chaos, let me put it that way. Uh, <laughs> if there is chaos, it's controlled no? because every day huh. is new. Huh. Um, yes. You wake up uh, today thinking that is what you're going to do and but you end up doing something else okay that's how it is <laughs> so consulting gives you a different flavor mm. and the biggest difference is that we don't work on one single thing we work on multiple things um, and uh, there are different sets of sizes of companies we work with uh, but we respect each and every client who we work for be it a large corporate or okay. a mid-sized firm or a startup because we feel that each of them are uh, doing something the growth journey where we can provide value to. Yes. So as answering your question, that's what is the biggest difference. We work with different sets of uh, clientele uh, and provide different kinds of solutions. And what industry does is you will you'll be probably in one department working on one set industry. of things. Not saying that you're not going to be experimenting, but that it's few and far between. Consulting gives you that flavor of doing multiple things. Uh, different solutions, different uh, companies and sizes you can work with. So one connected question to this, suppose if I'm a uh, consultant working, so I'll be working only on one project or is it two, three projects into say insurance bank like that? Fair question. Uh, so in the concept of uh, we try to ensure that someone who is in at the entry level uh, works on a project for a longer time. Mm. builds a specialization and then works on multiple projects. It's not that you first come in and immediately you start working on multiple because uh -huh, okay. it hampers your uh, uh, technical growth. So we want someone to become technically strong. So we tend to have people working on long term. When I say long term, at least for a year on mm. one particular client and one particular solution throughout the year. Once that person we know has ready and is, is looking for a change, we try to start making them working in multiple projects. Right. Okay. So the answering that, yes, there is, a, so there is a, at the early stages of your consulting journey, you will be working on one client or a long period of time and then gradually progress in working on multiple clients. The multitasking comes later on. Okay. Now, one question which I also asked you before, is consulting hectic? Uh, it's 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 uh, how you look at it. I think uh, it's it's. I think uh, today, Ganesh, if you had asked me, even industry has become hectic. It's just not consulting. Even okay. even even if you ask uh, for works, people work in the corporate world. They also have long hours, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, in consulting, you know, we encourage uh, our folks to you know uh, plan their time, plan their personal time. I know. Uh, plan the calendars to such a way that you know uh, they have uh, the work-life balance which we sp speak about you know we mm -hmm. tend to ask them to take control of it rather than us defining what work-life balance is mm -hmm. um, we have uh, periods of uh, up and down and I say there are certain s seasons where you know work is for us for example March is a very difficult time we tend right. to ask people you know to to be ready for those periods mm -hmm. and then uh, so to other parts of the year, you know, we tell them, you know, wherever there's lean time, we tell people, we encourage people to take breaks at the time. So hectic, uh, I think uh, it's a very uh, uh, subjective question. It depends on what you as an individual think, what is hectic and not hectic, uh, if I were to put it. Okay. Yeah. So one, I was also talking to one of the consultant in other company. So he told me that consulting gives an opportunity to understand the business model. So what is your take on that? He's absolutely right. That's, that's what happens. As I said at the start of the uh, podcast, when you asked me what we do as risk consulting, imagine uh, getting to know the uh, length and breadth of what uh, XYZ person is doing and knowing what the operations happen. The same person 
after he has learned all this, ends up uh, being part of a startup journey somewhere else because yeah, this is an idea. So he right. will say, how will I improve this idea further? Okay. So he or she, you'll find a lot of people who work in consulting have ended up in the startup journey also okay. because it sprouts a new idea. They're able to uh, use what they've learned in the, over the years to put into fruitation something which, you know, someone else may have not thought or right. something he thinks will bring bring more uh, benefit to the larger world. So okay, okay. Now, with respect to the uh, young professionals who want to join the consulting space, uh, you must be taking a lot of interviews. So, what is something, one or two things that you can share that people should avoid in interviews, and especially in risk consulting interviews? Mm. One of the things is, I think, uh, being well prepared. You see, one of the biggest mistakes I've seen is. Uh, CVs uh, and uh, what the person says, you know, it does not tally. Okay. These are all some basic uh, mistakes we have seen. Um, trying to portray a larger than life on the CV mm. and not able to comprehend what, what you're actually trying to say. Okay. Um, and uh, effective communication is important. You know, uh, you know, the concept of, you know, uh, listening to uh, speak and listening to understand, that's important. You know, okay. there is that basic uh, problem of, we find in interviews where people are eager to speak, not understanding what the question is. And, you know, <laughs> they, they, they want to, they want to actually uh, uh, give an answer to what, uh, what the question uh, situation is, something different to it. I think that's, that's important. And, um, the, uh, I mean, uh, the, there were a lot of interviews I've done. So this at the entry level, at least I know that, you know, um, the, many of them are uh, nervous, but you know, what they don't understand, an interview is not a, a interrogation or anything of the sort. It is for you, for right. an interviewer to understand you much better what you bring to the table. Right. And uh, that's what we tend to encourage. Uh, most of our interviews are interaction. It's more psychological and uh, personal, you know, in terms of understanding the person better. That's mm -hmm. what we try to do. Behavioral. We try to understand okay. behavioral part of the person. So we take situation based interviews. So when I'm trying to uh, do an interview, we tend to understand what is the person's strength and, you know, and what strength can be applicable for him when he joins okay. us. So we try to question on those grounds. So if many a times a person is able to give those situations, he or she passes. Okay. People who do, who tend to not answer those questions uh, correctly are the ones who tend to fail. Okay. So it is not a standard uh, question like, where do you see yourself after five years? No, that, what, what, it's, it's very subjective. I can't right. ask it. It has to be behavior. It has to be situation based. Okay. It has to be like, example is a fresher. I will ask him a question. Uh, give me a situation where you went through a difficult situation and how do you come up with a solution for it. An example is obviously he's not worked in a work environment. He may have done an exam. He may not understood a solution to a maths problem, but you okay. know, he put an effort to understand it. That is a, that is what, I, what I'm trying to get to is yeah. how, how you have come up with a solution to a particular problem. Well, this is a very interesting thing because normally when freshers look at interviews, they feel that there are certain set of questions which what are your negatives? What are your positives? These, but consulting is a very different ball game. And the the way you interview somebody at an entry level, obviously the interviewing at a consultant or a manager level is will be different. Correct. So what you look when you hire a manager? Manager is uh, see the the, the uh, level has changed. You have got years of experience. I, so as I told you, as a as a fresher, I told you what is the difficult situation you face. Similar question will be posted to the manager, but it will be in a work related situation. He must have gone through some, some mm -hmm. kind of a problem statement. He or she would be, able, should be able to explain to me the problem statement and say, what is the issue he come, what is the solution he came up to fix that problem? So okay. similar, but you know, to with an experience uh, associated with it. And as you go up, um, uh, we were speaking at the beginning of the podcast also, there is a, uh, uh, expectation of doing certain kind of sales also. So mm -hmm. what is that you've done on a sales side, on a business development? How have you coached people? So as a fresher, I can't ask him about what you've done in coaching. Obviously, he himself is a fresher. Who is he coach, going to coach? Right. A manager mm -hmm. will be expected he would have a set of team members. How he how he groomed a okay. team member, okay. how he ensured, you know, difficult conversations. How did he give constructive feedback? 
what was the feedback you know how, and how did the person uh, react to the feedback conflict situations these are things which we ask in our interviews because uh, asking um, so these are all your uh, so we call it competency based and technical so when i say technical your cv is your technical because which project you have uh, yes your project? experience plus okay competency is what we then get uh, that is our focus point technical your sound you may be you may, you may be a star mm-hmm. in what you do technical but people is what we deal with on a day to day basis so if yeah. you are not able to answer your people related questions properly mm-hmm. you are going to have challenges in operating an organization like ours where we are dealing with people on a day to day basis that's the main asset asset right so uh, from the managerial level generally you start managing a team uh, like before that, that also so um you are an individual contributor at an analyst or a consultant level majorly mm-hmm. then you become a senior consultant uh, in some places we call it assistant managers uh, you tend to have junior members reporting to you because you are basically doing a larger project you have people under you you have analyst and interns working with you so you start to have people manager your okay. managing skill starts from there because you can't expect a someone at a manager level starting to start managing people you need to start somewhere right 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 so one level down you prepare for the next yes. level that's a very interesting thing and that's what i think so a lot of people should also look in their career not only in consulting but career that if you want to if you are aspire to go somewhere you start preparing yourself from that space now let us come to one very good question which a lot of candidates might have compensation so when what are the factors which are going to impact your compensation and i'm not looking at numbers i'm looking at how you grow in uh, monetary wise in a consulting space so um i on a fresher you know it's a standard industry uh, hmm. uh, what do you call benchmark you know and then uh, once you move up uh, there are bandings so all this uh, levels which i spoke about have bandings hmm. as you progress and uh, uh, what decides your compensation is what uh, expertise or what specialization you bring in Okay. um and uh, that defines your uh, salary package but on the entry level uh, it is purely uh, a standard practice your fresher uh, it is more of an investment for that person because you will not find it as a graduate you're going to be earning a lot mm-hmm. a lot yeah, of money yes, yes. Uh, but uh, as you bring brings in, as you build your experience and years of experience you tend to grow okay within the organization and obviously it is just not about salary it's about uh, the bonus also so mm-hmm. uh, if an exa- if a person is done exceedingly well obviously the bonus which he gets will be uh, paid to him right. at the end of the year which is not as uh, uh, while in industry there is this standard uh, which in consulting there is a possibility to earn more mm. because of the fact that uh, there is that uh, risk and reward so right uh, so the more the person has worked well there's a opportunity to the, the guy to get more on the variable part okay but is i'm not aware about it but you have to you can con, uh, confirm this so do we also take clients feedback yes we do ha huh. we so, you do but this happens at a manager level and higher so there are two sets of feedback there is an internal feedback so for appraisals also we have uh, project based appraisals so for example if you have done seven up seven projects seven different uh, appraisals are created for that person okay. who get feedback on each project that will decide a person's um, what do you call uh, uh, what uh, for the appraisal uh, the overall appraisal yeah, the, it, it will collate it and okay. uh, that person will get so called uh, rated an aetc and his bonus and his Okay. his promotion etc will be decided through those projects that is on internal on the external side especially when you are a, a, a senior manager and above or even as a manager and above because you're working with clients um, there is something called clients uh, uh, client satisfaction feedback okay. so uh, the the client who are worked with we send our uh, what do you call questionnaire for them to uh, fill and mm-hmm. send back and uh, they will rate us in terms of how they felt the whole okay. value which has been provided and then you know you have uh, either you say it's a uh, deterrent or you know or promoter <laughs> you know the promoter score right. and all stuff right. and that is for us to also introspect so so one is external which is coming from the internal when you said it's basically the your manager 
will give you some yes, rating. Yes. Okay. What was your performance for a particular project? Okay. Okay. And that will then translate into your overall appraisal. Overall appraisal. Obviously, that is just project led, and there are other things, other facets, KPIs, which needs to ah. also add up right. for X Y Z to uh, to get a particular rating or a promotion or a increment. So these are all factors, but. For feedback purpose, there's internal feedback uh, uh, mechanism, uh, which will allow for the person to get uh, constructive uh, feedback or praise, you want to call it, mm. for the projects done. And uh, there are certain mechanism uh, in consulting where uh, there is uh, spot awards and you know all that stuff which is given for right. by the managers for good job done. And there is extra rep i would say these are more in terms of keeping the person motivated to say right. that you've done a good job so that instead of just rewarding at the end of the year for a good job done there is that constant uh, reward given to the person throughout the year for he or she to be motivated or to say that you know, you're done doing a good job the contrary also is true where someone may not be doing that well so how do you address it and not fix it at the end of the year okay and throughout your journey if you can highlight two, three key lessons that you have learned the day you started into this consulting space. And Actually, uh, honestly, say Ganesh, when I started um, in my first journey at Big Four, I did have a breakdown and I, I never thought I would spend 15 plus years in this journey. So I think um, I uh, what I would say is that perseverance is important in this. Uh, mm -hmm. So you got to love your job. You got to be passionate about it uh, you need to have a discipline okay and you, you need to have the attitude right attitude you know you may be a uh, uh, highly qualified but if you don't have the right attitude it will be very difficult for you to uh, okay. uh, what you call progress not only in consulting any walk of life hmm. i think uh, having the right and a disciplined way of doing things will go in a long way in having a successful career. Wonderful, wonderful, Ram. So thank you very much. I mean, uh, the entire conversation uh, is going to be very interesting for a lot of people who are looking at risk consulting. So because there are a lot of myths, a lot of misinformation which is there. So your conversation definitely can help them, guide them and motivate to enter into the space and create a career. My. So thank you very much for taking out time. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You.